I guess we're going to say something. New. It's a dark, uh, just so you know, uh, Jesse Eisenberg wrote a beautiful play. We're going to show you um, in the beginning. It's a scene from the beginning, pretty much, right when the play starts. Uh, we play roommates. Uh, this is Ben's apartment. He is uh, an aspiring filmmaker. I'm getting my MBA at NYU Stern School of Business, and I'm from Nepal. And uh, and then we just begin acting. Cool. Sure. Okay. <laughs> More nervous to do this now than on stage. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hey. Uh, oh. Uh, hey, Ben. Did you film anything today? <coughs> Nothing needed to be filmed. Mm. I saw this thing I think you might have liked. I know how you're always trying to capture like real and dramatic moments for your film. Compelling, not dramatic. There's a difference. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Sorry, compelling. I saw this compelling situation I think you might have liked. Okay, so there's a man eating food out of a garbage bag that he had clearly torn open himself. And then a dog ran up and started eating out of the same bag. And the guy didn't mind. Like they were eating the same food, the man and the dog. It was like so... Strange and disgusting, but it was also like peaceful in a way, you know? <laughs> Made me feel like we can all just coexist even in this gruesome way. All right, wrap it up, buddy. Long story short. Yeah, okay, sorry. I'm just, I'm getting to it. So, okay, so this rich looking woman, or uh, rich looking woman approaches, right? And she grabs the dog away by the collar and yells at it for eating the food from the garbage. She says something like, uh, she says, uh, oh yeah, okay, she says, Baxter, no, we don't eat food from the garbage. She said, we, like Baxter the dog, and she eat the same kind of food. But the food from the garbage was good enough for the homeless man. I just thought it was so sad to see how human beings can value animals over another person, like another stranger who happens to be a human being. And I just thought it might be really interesting for your film. Yeah. <clears throat> all due respect, man, it's not really that interesting. <laughs> I mean, I see shit like that all the time. And it's kind of cliche to show like a sad homeless dude eating garbage. Yeah, it's probably not the most original thing in the world. Yeah, it's right? probably the most unoriginal thing in the world, okay? And that's the fucking problem with these NYU assholes. You know, it's like they, they take a picture of a homeless guy and they call it art, you know? <laughs> no, it's like, fuck you, that's not art. Might be art if you were homeless, but then you wouldn't be at fucking NYU, now would you? Yeah, you're right. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, and I'm sorry, to, I'm sorry to put that in NYU. I know you're still happy there. Yeah. <laughs> well, they didn't kick me out. Yeah, well, you're in the business school, my friend. It's a much different pile of shit, okay? And they didn't kick me out either. We had a mutual falling out. And I know you did. Okay, and the graduate department can suck my shit because they didn't know what they had on their hands with me, all right? They didn't know what to think of me, all right? What fucking little box to put me in. Well, guess what? What? Well, I don't know what. When my movie comes out, uh -huh. I will get an honorary PhD, okay? A fucking PhD. And don't think I won't accept it because I will accept it. Yes, yes, I'll fucking accept it. And I'll even make a classy speech and I'll even say thank you and even shake hands with those fuckwads because if there's one thing I've learned from my struggling, it's that the best revenge is a life well lived. That's very sage. Thanks, man. You want some weed? No. I'm going to smoke some nonetheless. OK. Yo, hmm. I, ha I had a kind of shitty day, Bunty. I mean, I mean, shitty compared to my other days, not compared to like world events or anything. What happened? So I'm crossing Third Avenue. Yeah. And I run into this kid that I went to elementary school with, Ted. <laughs> he said he's getting married. What a douchebag, right? <laughs> I don't know, is he? All I know is that he's named Ted and that he's getting married. Yeah. So he says to me, he says to me, can you believe I'm actually getting married? Uh -huh. He says, can you believe I'm finally settling down? So I said, yes, I can. You're a boring Jewy douchebag from New Jersey. You never had a girlfriend. <laughs> of course I can believe you're settling down. What the fuck else are you going to do? Mow someone's lawn? <laughs> I hope you actually didn't say that. No, no, no. I said congratulations. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I was thinking that pretty loud and clear. So message received. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, Ted got a job working on Wall Street. He's some kind of hotshot oh. fuck or something. Hey, really? Did you ask him which firm? Yeah, I asked him for his whole life story. We were crossing the okay, street, Kyan. I didn't get into all that well, shit. Well, did you ask him if there was a job opening? You don't want to work on Wall Street. No, Ben, that's exactly where I want to work. Why else do you think I'm here? Well, you're here to learn, okay? You're here to learn, and I told you, you don't need a job. I don't want rent from you. Well, Your money's no good. I don't here. want to rely on you. I want to pay you rent. Fine, then I'll ask him if there's a fucking job, man. Get <laughs> off my jock. He gave me his number. Fine, if it's a problem, just let me know. No, no, he actually. He, he, he actually wanted to hang out with us. He did. No, he, he, he said we should get together for drinks. Yeah, dude. What? Dude, come on. What kind of bourgeois bullshit is that? Get together for drinks. <laughs> come on. You never hear someone in the Democratic Republic of the fucking Congo say, hey, let's get together for drinks. Especially because there's a drought. No. <laughs> you know, that's actually funny, man. You know, your sense of humor is burgeoning. Thanks. I learned from the best. Yeah, I'm the best. Anyway, you want to hear the fucking kicker of it all? Ah, the real, like, salt in the wound of this whole thing. Guess who this guy is marrying? Sarah Newberg. I don't know who that is. 
She's the first girl I ever got an erection for, Sarah fucking Newberg. Really? Yeah. Like your first crush, huh? Yeah. Yeah, and it pisses me off. Ah, if I'm being honest, Bunty, it really does piss me off. Well, I know it does, buddy. Man, the world is not fair. Well, you know that. You're from Nepal. But, <laughs> uh, but it's unfair here, too, sometimes. I just feel like everything is so fucked sometimes. Sarah was like, uh, Sarah was really nice to me. It's going to be okay, man. What? It's going to be okay. Yeah, I, what? I know that. Dude, I fucking know, th I know that. Okay. Dude, anyway, she's probably like ugly as shit by now. She probably like turned into her mother. You know, all hips, no ass. But she was cute, if I'm being honest. Hey, are you jealous of Ted? Jealous? Yeah, it's okay if you are. I'm just Fuck no, he's an idiot. He's a fucking banker. I'm actually doing something with my life, okay? I don't have time for some bitch in my ear. Anyway, taking me away from my work. Yeah, you're gonna do great things. Oh, man. come on, dude, come on. I'm not saying all bankers are idiots. He's a fucking Jewish banker from New Jersey, all right? He's a fucking Shylock, all right? Perpetuating stereotypes that, frankly, I don't need right now. It's different than you being in finance. How is it different than me being in finance? Look, it's kind of hard to describe because okay. you're not from here, okay? But if you're born in the States and you're white and you're fucking Jewish and you're middle class, banking is kind of seen as an easy way out. It doesn't have the nobility that you think. Wait, I don't think it's necessary necessarily noble, Ben. I wouldn't call it noble. I don't think it's any more or less noble than any other job. I find it interesting, and I think it's a good way to make a living. Okay, fine, but for a Jewish kid from the suburbs, and I'm fucking speaking as a Jewish kid from the suburbs, yeah. it's not interesting, and it's a shitty way to make a living. Okay, look, it's like I, if I was, uh, hey, it's like okay. if I was born in Nepal, like yeah. you, okay? And I, and I wanted to be a Sherpa, or a Gurkha, or a Parka, or whatever. <laughs> That would be like, that would be an easy way out. Gurkhas are considered the preeminent fighting squad in the world. I'm sure they're great. Sherpas can summit Everest without oxygen. Fine. Parkas keep you insulated from a cold breeze. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's very cute, okay? That's very, you're funny. Okay, but what I'm, just, what I'm trying to say is, and I'm trying to basically not insult you, yeah. is the fact that you're from a fucking poor country. I'm sorry, a poor country, and you've come to the States to study business is admirable in a way that for a fucking Jew, sorry, for a Jew from the suburbs is predictable. What about movies? What the fuck about movies? You want to make movies. I do. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You do make movies, yeah. right? Isn't the movie industry disproportionately Jewish? Yes, and I have two answers for you that I've already thought of because I think about this shit all the time, okay? Oh. One is that I'm not gonna be some fucking rich casting couch like film executive, okay? And the other is that arts and cinema can reflect life and push boundaries in ways that moving money around to make more of it will simply never be able to, okay? And I, and I was getting a degree in film theory. I'll be making a fucking pittance and I'm perfectly okay with that. And you could always borrow money from your father. You wanna hit? Is it still marijuana? Yeah. No. <laughs> My father is a prick, okay? Hey, Bunty. Yeah. Yo, Bunty, can I tell you a secret? Yeah, of course, please. Okay, wait, have I offended you with the banking comments? No, because if I've offended you, I'm sorry, no. but I'm also, frankly, uncomfortable moving forward if I've offended you. I'm not offended. Okay, because I couldn't live with myself. I would actually, I'd fucking kill myself in some okay. way if I've offended you, and I can't keep, like, moving forward thinking I've hit an animal in the road. No, I can't keep driving forward thinking there's, like, a dead animal there's behind no dead us. dead animal. Because okay. I think you're a fucking awesome person. Okay, and the fact that you are like from Nepal and you're like studying business at NYU or whatever makes you an awesome friend and an awesome roommate and I am proud as shit that we know each other. I am also proud of this relationship. Yeah. <laughs> you know you're a stand-up guy, Bunty? Thanks. All right, here's my secret. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so <clears throat> when I was eight years old, mm. I had a dream about Sarah Newberg, uh, this fuckface's new fiance. Wait, like a sex dream? It was more than a sex dream. It was, um... hey, is it cool if I tell you something kind of disgusting? I think so. <laughs> Are you easily nauseated? Uh, in Kathmandu, I had Giardia for four months, so I have a pretty strong stomach. Oh. Dude, I'm sorry to hear about your Giardia. It's okay, it's all cleared up. Yeah? Yeah. All right. So when I was eight years old, I had a dream that I was lying on the floor of my second grade classroom. Um, I had pushed the desks against the wall, and I had spread newspaper neatly all over the floor, mm -hmm. and I was lying on the newspaper. I was face up and naked, and um, <laughs> here's the disgusting part. I'm kind of embarrassed to say. Go ahead, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Okay, so Sarah Newberg, the uh, well, the presumably respectable fiance of the douchebag I just ran into, was actually standing over me. Uh, she was straddling my face. Um, she was also naked, and. Um, well, she was shitting on me. She was defecating on you. Yeah, on my face, on my face. Yeah. Oh God, I feel fucking awful about this. I'm so mortified. Oh my God, I've never told anyone this before. Hmm. Do you know what it's like to go through life with this image stuck in your dumb head, a naked eight-year-old girl shitting on your face? <laughs> oh God, hey Bunty. Hmm. Am I awful? Let me think for a moment. Yeah, yeah, take your time, buddy. Okay, 
Yeah, I mean, I think if you... Yeah, okay. I think if you had the dream now, yeah. and Sarah was still the eight-year-old girl, then yeah, that would be pretty awful, yeah. right? But, <laughs> but seeing as you were both eight at the time of the dream, I think it's perfectly natural to have those sorts of tendencies. I don't think that you need to be ashamed at all. And in fact, in fact, Ben, I think it's very brave that you admitted it. Dude, how do you always know what to say to make me feel better? I also have a, another thought that I think might make you feel better. Another thought that yeah. might make me feel better. Sorry. Okay. Mm. Oh, I fucking love you. Go okay. Ahead. Sorry. Okay. I think it's very responsible the way you laid out newspaper in your dream. <laughs> I think it says a lot more about your character <laughs> that you laid out a newspaper <laughs> to protect the floor of the classroom and to catch the fecal matter <laughs> that I take it missed your face. Then it does about your sexual deviances. In fact, I don't think that you need to be embarrassed about that dream at all. I think it shows a great character and an ability to love another person despite their off-putting bodily functions. Mm -hmm. The fact that she's doing that on your face yeah. and you still love her yeah. is so sweet. <laughs> it makes me feel like you're gonna make some other woman really happy someday. Who the fuck are you? You are the most perfect person that ever exists. I've been haunted okay. by this for 20 years. Listen to me though, Ben. Having said all of this, I do have one piece of advice that you can either choose to heed or not to heed. Yes, of course, please advise. Okay. Of course I'll heed, you perfect fucking specimen of a friend. If you're asked to make a speech at the upcoming wedding, I would leave this story out. <laughs> <laughs> you are the best fucking roommate I have ever had in my life. Do you know that? Dude, you really fucking are. And you know what? Oh my god, you know what? I would actually love that Wall Street douchebag to meet you. Oh, I would fucking love that. My crazy Nepalese roommate. Yo, let's get that fuck over here for some drinks. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry I forgot the pricey. That's why you should let real professional actors do the heavy lifting. <laughs> right, yeah. Oh, no, no. It's good, it's good, it's good. It's funny talking about it and then suddenly getting into it and doing it. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, strange. Yes, well, yeah. I had a chance to see the show oh, great. Uh, last weekend, and it was a uh, reception similar to this. People got it. They were into it. And just overall, it was uh, just a great experience at the theater, acting, mm. directing, writing. And that set thanks. is awesome. Oh, thanks. Oh, yeah. thanks. So um, you're here, and thank you for coming to Google this afternoon. And uh, um, we'll s sort of alternate some, with some questions for a little bit, then ask the gang if they would like to step up and ask great. a couple. So I'll start from my left. Jesse, you're mm -hmm. someone now, you're, you've actually got a pretty um, a continuous career as a playwright. This is your third off-Broadway production mm -hmm. here in New York, and, uh, and you, you act and you write. And mm -hmm. so for you, when did you start feeling like you wanted to write down the stuff that you wanted to act, and how, how you, did you get into that as a craft? Um, I, I have been writing for a long time, but I would never with the intention of acting in the plays uh, or the other things that I've written that were not plays. But like I, um, including this one, in fact, I tried to find other actors to do the part before I did it because I f just feel a lot of um, anxiety doing the shows, uh, not because I don't like performing them, but I just feel so, I've, you know, just like the general you know, stage fright that people have. So I try to avoid acting in them, but then uh, it, gets, it gets into a point where I feel like I'm the only person who could do it because it's in my mind so specifically. Um, and you know, now that I'm doing the play with, the, there's a, this is actually, a, this play has a cast of five. Uh, Kunal is like this, the other main character with me and now I can't picture anybody else but him doing it. So now um, you end up kind of boxing yourself in psychologically. But um, I uh, partly, uh, I will say though, an answer more specifically to your question, partly it's like a lot of the characters that I write probably stem from real things or maybe even frustrations I have as an actor. Uh, like if I'm playing a certain role and I don't like the role for whatever set of circ reasons that I, that I, I feel uncomfortable by, maybe I'll write the uh, you know, opposite or the inverse role for uh, like a play. Okay, that's great to know. And then when you actually do let it go and other companies pick it up, you'll have a chance to see how other people interpret your work. Yeah, I saw my last play, I saw it in actually, it was in Israel, uh, it's still playing there. I saw it in Hebrew. Uh, and it was yeah, it was wonderful. Uh, partly there because of the language barrier, I wasn't like so critical of it because I couldn't hear what they're saying. But uh, <laughs> it was a nice experience. So, and then now with Kunal, you've um, you've done a lot of stage work. Actually, has it been a while for you since since you've been on stage and, yeah. and having uh, been in New York before? Uh, uh, the last play I did was in 2007 in Los Angeles. But we shoot Big Bang in front of a live audience. 
So that's every Tuesday night. So you, you know, it's not like I would was never haven't been on stage since 2007. I'm on stage every Tuesday night, but it's obviously a different atmosphere. Um, but yeah, I mean, being on that show for eight years has really prepped me. I thought it would be the opposite. I thought I'm been stuck playing this this one character for eight years. Will I remember how to do this? You know, but I think I was silly in not realizing that I've learned a lot over the last eight years. Well, so your acting muscles were already in pretty good shape. Um, yeah, yeah. And not that I've been, yeah, I, there was a joke and I uh, lost it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking about good heavy time. lifting and was heavy lifting I mean, I'm not doing heavy joke. lifting or something. Anyway, it's, it's Go through the details <laughs> of the joke. They're funniest. Jesse thing. writes my jokes for me, yeah, yeah. so <laughs> I haven't had time this morning yeah, yeah. to prep. Right. Well, and you guys have such an amazing chemistry on stage. Uh, what's it been like for you developing the relationship with each other and working? And, and what sort of things do you do for each other on stage that make it all the more fun to do? Uh, you know, I think there's like a few things happening on stage between actors in plays that don't happen the same way in movies, um, which is that I think there's this kind of like almost telepathic relationship that's occurring underneath the surface of the dialogue and the behavior, which is we are so in tune with each other by virtue of having done it so many times and knowing what each other are trying to accomplish on stage and what we're trying to accomplish as a group that there's almost this kind of like tacit uh, um, uh, dialogue that's occurring uh, simultaneously with the play. We know the, you know, uh, the, the tonight will be our like 40th show or something, and we've rehearsed for two months, so we have like a sense of like the minute pauses. I mean, half second pauses that we know affect the other guy, and the other guy doesn't like that half second pause. And it's not something we've ever articulated, you know, explicitly, but we know that that's what the other guy's go. That's what's going on in his mind. That you end up creating this really kind of incredible unspoken dialogue. Um, and it's really special. Uh, and every night is different. That's the thing. Right. You have no idea what the audience is going to bring on any given night, where they're going to laugh, what they're going to say. If someone coughs over a line, you have to repeat that information to set up for another joke. So you have to be so incredibly in tune with each other. Sometimes you drop a line, or sometimes you get caught up in the moment, and you, you do something that is out of the ordinary, that you're not used to, and the, you're the person on stage, you have to trust that they're going to pick it up. Sometimes maybe. Maybe you're not feeling it, maybe not in the moment, and then your partner just grabs your face and looks you in the eye, and then you're like back into it. You know, there's so much going on on stage, and anything can change on in any given moment. Anything can change, and that's the beauty of being blessed enough to work with a talented actor like Jesse is that you have complete trust. Anything can happen, no matter what happens. You you have complete trust that you're not going to be left hanging. Well, yeah, that's also the beauty of live theater. Yeah, yeah. And so as you've gone mm. from words on a page to working with each other and a director and now on stage, what are some of the things that both of you have learned or insights you've had about either the, the play itself or about yourself as an actor, either one of you? Go ahead. Um, yeah, I feel like you know acting is uh, acting is a bit like kind of like playing the drums. Like it's kind of hard to do it on your own. And um, I do feel like the more practice you get at it, the better you become. That sounds like an obvious thing, but it's unfortunately, it's not acting as a profession is not really thought of that way because you don't necessarily have to have a degree. You don't necessarily have to have specific training. A lot of times, the most famous people that you see in the profession of acting have never are not really good at it. You know, just by virtue of them being very attractive, huh. whatever. You know, whatever. It's just the the nature of the profession. Yeah. Uh, it's not something that we deal with. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so like, it's an unusual profession in that regard. And I think getting to do a play every night and rehearsing for it, you just end up getting better at your job by virtue of doing it a lot. I guess it's like the Malcolm Gladwell you know, philosophy in that, in that way. And so, um, uh, so I think we're getting better in the play. But I think probably even more importantly, you know, we're probably getting better at our job just by virtue of doing it. Well, that's always great to hear, and it's also because you're putting something into something that you love. You get stuff back, which is really cool. That's right. Yeah. So yes, yeah, so and you have a, an MFA actually. So you've you've done some serious acting training. So what are the sort of things that that you'd like to continue to work on and accomplish? And what are the things that you feel like you bring to a role like this? Um, I think it's you know grad school really taught me how to prepare. I think that's something that you don't. It's hard sometimes to realize how to break down a script and prepare. Um, oftentimes, actors will just show up to the first rehearsal without having thought about a lot. And that's fine. And then they'll still be incredible. But for me, I really have to take the time to be meticulous about every single beat and try to think about everything and try to create every moment so that when I do rehearse, I'm not thinking about what I have to say next. It's, I'm just saying it in the moment. You know? And I think that's what grad school really taught me is if you don't know your lines or if you feel ill-prepared, then you're doing the work in rehearsal. You're like you're not really doing the work. You know what I mean? You're working on it by yourself in rehearsal as opposed to just being present and being there for your, your partners or being there for the director. Um, and I think that's what 
going through a regular program really teaches you is how to prepare. I think that's really important too. So, and you've both now, you, you do work a lot, you're committed to your craft, which is a great thing, and you add to, I guess, you know, your, your quiver full of talents, um, you know, as you move on to the next thing. So, um, this show has been wonderful. What sort of things are you thinking about doing next for both of you? I have to go back to season nine in August. <laughs> so. I, so I, I don't have much opportunity to think about. I have a book coming out September 15th about my journey from New Delhi to Los Angeles called Yes, My Accent is Real. And, huh. uh, and then, and, then uh, and, <laughs> and I'm competing, unfortunately, against Jesse's book that comes out in September 15th as well. What is that called? It's called My Accent's Fake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So tell us both about the book, because when you have something, obviously the people here are going to want to read the book. So tell us the, the real title mm -hmm. yeah. um, and <laughs> the publisher and about when it's coming out. Um, do you want to finish? Oh, yeah. Uh, my book, uh, Yes, My Accent is Real. It's about my journey from Delhi to L.A. and, you know, and growing up in India and a lot of fun stuff. And it's Atria, Simon & Schuster. It's out September 15th. Okay. Uh, my book is actually uh, it's called Bream Gives Me Hiccups. It's a collection of uh, short stories. Um, some have been published in the New Yorker or McSweeney's uh, in the Shouts and Murmurs section of New Yorker. Um, and um, uh, it's coming out uh, Grove Atlantic in September. And uh, yeah, it's like uh, short humor. Yeah, I love the essays in the New Yorker. Those oh, thanks. Are fun. <laughs> no, thanks. That actually, it, it's in some ways here, in many ways, like a classic New York writer, because you act, you write, you have stuff in the New Yorker, you show up and you do interesting things. Is that something, I guess it is something that clearly feeds you. Yeah, I like it. I haven't like set out to kind of copy that particular path, which I think uh, we can read as Jewish. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, but I like all those things. Yeah, there's probably like some kind of, let's say, like, you know, cultural glue that binds those things together, but I like them for like separate reasons. Uh, so the, the next thing I'm doing in, in a month, I start like a Woody Allen's next movie. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I guess there, you know, so it seems almost like as an outsider in retrospect, kind of like, yeah, obviously all linked to each other. But, um, but I like feeling, I like doing these things for different reasons. And I feel like when we're on stage, it feels more like I don't know, it feels like we're like in a wrestling match on stage or something. It's like this very visceral, emotional, cathartic experience on stage. Like what you just saw is the beginning of the play, but the, the play becomes a very dark play. Uh, as you could see in the opening, there's kind of, there's some elements underneath lurking that feel dangerous. It doesn't feel like I'm performing like a kind of light, witty thing. Like it feels like this very visceral thing. Uh, so I don't see the connection as much between like you know writing humor for the New Yorker and performing this thing, which uh, feels like a UFC fight or something, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's exhausting. It is. I hope you guys come see the play. Je it's rare to find a, an actor who can write as well as Jesse, and and you know. So while it's on, I think it's a great opportunity to, to see the future. Yes. Of the yes. Jewish wow. industry. That yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you, we're, we're about to take over. Yeah. <laughs> Not just entertainment, but some parts of law and Wall Street. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is such a good show, and it makes me happy as a theater goer to see some, a piece that's overall that strong, which makes it just sometimes when you go to the theater, you go, oh, oh we're just not going to look at that actor that much. Or, right, right, oh, yeah. man, I wish the door hadn't fallen off. And stuff like that. Our so doors stay on our the doors. Show. Yeah. <laughs> Th there you go. It's, 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 come, it's, not, it's not been hinged fully sometimes, right? It's come that's apart. True. So you yeah, had some true. issues with the broom last week. Oh, you were that you show? You were that yes. show? Oh, God. <laughs> Fucking. <laughs> that was one performance. Literally. One per the one before the broom. It just broom kept fell. falling out. I just I took it off stage and I threw it in backstage. But like, you, you dealt with it. You dealt with it in the moment as you would. You just picked it up and said, oh, it's not staying there. That was just Kunal being like, yeah. Fuck it. Yeah. I think Olivier did the same thing, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. It's me okay. and Olivier. So if you want, people can start, you know, heading up to the microphones. Yeah, we'll have ask us one questions. On either Please, side. Ask us and anything. I know we have uh, some folks here who are huge fans of the both of you. Yeah. And, you know, you get to head back to this really, really funny show very soon. <laughs> and that, that people here, as I'm sure you can, you can imagine, they quote it religiously and often wear the T-shirts. Oh, yeah. Cool. <laughs> yes. Um, Not so if anybody at all. Yeah, exactly. uh, would <laughs> no, like to make their way to the um, to the microphone, we can have a couple minutes of chat. Look, there's good. There's people actually. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Don't be shy, please. Shout it out if you don't use the mic. I mean. Hi so. there. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I'm just. This is for both of you guys. I'm wondering, 
Is there any sort of like connecting thread that you guys have noticed between the types of characters that you most enjoy playing when you get those sorts of roles? Um, you want to? I mean, I like I I like I use I mean the characters I've written for this is my third play to be done in New York. I'm, the, the characters I guess are all considered despicable people, but I <laughs> that seems to me the most interesting thing to play because then the job is to kind of like humanize these people that are otherwise doing horrible things. I mean, the play the guy becomes really off the rails towards the end of the play uh, of what we just did, and um, yeah, to me that's exhilarating because then my job is to like humanize them in the same way that if somebody is like a terrible person in real life, you know. If you ask them, they'll defend themselves and they'll have some kind of emotional reason for doing for behaving that way. Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to oftentimes get cast as the sweet, innocent, naive guy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but in this play. But in this play, talk about it. exactly. But in this play, um, this character is very. When you see the whole play, you'll realize that this this character is grounded. He's a very much he's a very much a grounded guy, which is rare for me, and I'm lucky to have an opportunity to actually play someone with some gravitas. Yeah, in all the ways he pacifies my character in this first scene, which he does in a kind of submissive way, uh, you know, I'll kind of, you know, come around. He kind of grows up in the play. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You got anybody else? Yes. Over the course of your acting, both your acting careers, you've met really incredible people, and I, I so admire both your works. I love Big Bang Theory, and I watch a lot of your movies to see. And so I was wondering what like celebrities that you've met that you just really admire as well, and what was the funniest interaction with any celebrity? I met Jesse Eisenberg about two months ago. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was funny. It was really funny. Really? Tell him what happened. <laughs> Tell him exactly what happened. Tell him what happened. So Jesse, uh, <laughs> no, nothing. nothing <laughs> <laughs> like, is there a story there that I forgot? No, 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 no. <laughs> I remember meeting Stephen Hawking when he was going to be on Big Bang. Um, he came to set to watch a run through, and you know, obviously, it, it's it's quite a sight to spend time with him. Obviously, it can be just you know of his state and also of who he is, and so. It was just amazing being in his presence, and he he watched the run through, and in the run through, Simon Helberg is actually making fun of Stephen Hawking and doing his voice. <laughs> oh really? Yeah, and I'm like, and we're doing this run through, and I just like looked at Stephen Hawking, and Stephen Hawking was smiling, <laughs> and he loved it. But he loved it, but he went home and read the script again, and now he's come on our show like three or four times, so it's really cool to meet him. Cool. We yeah, we got to meet Leonard Nimoy too. All the like all the people that you would imagine would be in the Big Bang Theory. That was fun. That's funny. Yeah. What about you? Um, Tell them about when you met uh, George Clooney. You guys oh my God, no? George. Um, <laughs> 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 Ugh, I'm rarely tongue-tied, but um, no. <laughs> uh, no. Um, well, uh, you know, it's interesting to s for me to see like the people who seem to be at the kind of most accomplished point in their lives or careers or artistic achievements who are still really worried about it. So like the last play I did, the main actress was Vanessa Redgrave. She's like 76 years old, 77 years old at the time. And she was in the theater like every day, four o'clock for an eight o'clock show pouring over her script. Um, okay. Um, and um, <laughs> no, 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 but it's just amazing. You think like here, this woman doesn't, this woman is like finished accomplishing anything that anybody could accomplish something, not because of her age, just because of her achievements. And she's still like kind of really worried about the play. You know, we did like, let's say 90 shows or something, the 89th show, she's sitting backstage panicked. Um, and uh, you know, that's to me is like the most impressive thing that somebody is still worried about it, which tells me, A, it's okay to worry about doing a good job. That doesn't mean you're not going to do a good job. It probably means you're going to do a better job. And B, uh, that there's no point that you reach that you can become complacent. Um, and I think that it transcends industry and talent and achievement. That's, I think, like the life lesson that I took from that. We're always scared we're never going to work again. I mean, I, I mean seriously, we're, that's, it's, it's weird being an actor because you never know when your next paycheck is going to come from. I mean, but you know, you know what I mean. On Big Bang Theory, yeah. you kind of. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. But more than just fears of like industrial collapse, more the fears of just like I want to do good for myself. Even yeah. if it's for you know 17 people are in the audience tonight, well, you want to do good for yourself. If no one's in the audience, you want to do good for yourself. And that's that's I think the, probably the, the biggest thing. And then all this other stuff like the money or success or whatever that probably will follow if you're doing all those other things well. Uh, what's the funniest like g gaff that you've done, either like on a movie set or during a play or anything? We don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very serious. Every single night, thing. perfect. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> One time I thought we'd screw up, but it didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thanks. <laughs> it's always incredible to see working artists and then diversified working artists like you both write. You're doing a serial. You're in all these movies simultaneously. 
uh, I guess the one thing that always baffles me is how do you deal with burnout? Like, what is your schedule and how do you even start to fight potential burnout? And how do you keep everything aligned so that you can stay focused, moving from task to task to task that you kind of either are recruited for or you're just kind of creating yourselves? We get 20% of our week time off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Google joke. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> they all get 20%. Yeah, uh, you get what? 20% what? 20% of their jobs. They get to work on You guys homes. hiring? I mean, <laughs> always. Burnout. You know, burnout is like the luckiest actor in the world gets burnout. Yeah. Because typically you're not working as much as it seems. We're in like a very public thing. So, like, you know, I pass the subway every day and there's pictures of Kunal for his show, but I know. He has nothing to do with it for these three months. And similarly, like I am in a poster that's coming out or whatever. Like, but I, I did that movie a year and a half ago. So I think I think the nature of our jobs makes it look like we're probably working more than yes than we actually are. We have downtime in between our projects. But I mean, there is there are times when you feel exhausted and you sleep and you wake up the next morning and you're fine. Like all of us. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Like I mean, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do with your ambition? What's burnout? You know. Uh, if you, uh, seriously, what are you gonna? What do you do with your ambition? You can't do anything with it. You have to just keep reaching, and so I don't. I don't. Burnout is not a word in my vocabulary. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but so yeah. I don't know why I said that. That's because <laughs> <not, laughs> you don't know the word. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's not in the vocabulary. because I don't actually understand <laughs> yeah. English that well. Thank you guys. Oh, uh, thank you very much. Thanks. And we have one more over here. Right on. Uh, so thanks for coming, guys. Thank uh, this question is more for Jesse, and it's sort of off topic. So feel free to punt on it if you want. But uh, given your involvement in the social network and given the fact that you're here and also given, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, well, I guess, yeah, that's kind of what I'm getting at is there's a bit of a common theme there, right? But also looking at some of the opinions that were apparent in the opening scene on the banking industry. Or whatever, oh, yeah, yeah. Do you have any specific opinions on how Google sits right now? Oh, right, uh, right. <laughs> In one. the world, you know? No, no, no. Could there I mean, be a play in the future that involves maybe some yeah, of these yeah. Right. Uh, no, no, honestly, not at all. No, I mean, I mean, I, I, I know, like, really nothing about any of those industries. Um, <laughs> my character, though, also knows nothing. He is a guy who demonizes banking because he's jealous of anybody sure. having a job. Sure. And he runs into this guy in the street who's in marrying this girl he likes. So that's where that comes from. I know nothing about those industries. Act, acting in a movie, playing a guy who knows about computers is really just that. It's the same as probably the actors who are in Jurassic Park knowing about Tyrannos <laughs> Ty Tyrannosaurus Rex. That's, that's a good they comparison. probably know very little. As or playing an astrophysicist who knows right. shit about anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right yeah. on. All right, thanks. So thanks. But I don't know. You guys seem like the smartest people on Earth work here. So I'm sure I'm sure you guys will do good things. and be. I mean, I don't know. I mean, so my opinion of Google is that it seems like it's being like you know, populated by the greatest minds in the world. So I guess that's wonderful. I don't know on the corporate side what they're doing. Maybe it's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Wow. Oh, so we'll go along with that, that the greatest minds work here. OK, um, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> OK, so we have one here, and then one last question to wrap it up. Um, this is, I guess, especially for Jesse. You seem uh, pretty into your craft. Uh, what would you, where would you like to see yourself in 20 years to say, like, yeah, I've had a good career? or? What would uh, make you happy? What are you aiming for? Spoilers? Uh, yeah. It sounds uh, like that's something you like I just about. I want to do it more. I, I can't like this play that we're doing now. It just like came from like a flurry of like thoughts and you know bad emotions and stuff like that. And so like I I, I don't I don't I don't have like any kind of real discipline. That's what I would like. I, I write a lot, but I don't have like the, the discipline. I want to be able to a develop some discipline and be able mm -hmm. to maintain it. And I don't have that now. I've been very prolific. I'm also have I have the great advantage of being like a known actor, so people will publish my books and plays. You know, they're probably on par with the other things that are being published, but they probably get to the top of the pile a little more quickly. So I'd like to be able to continue working, and that's 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 my goal. Um, so I have two. If you have time for only one, that's fine. Um, so one, uh, taking a step back, I'm curious when in your lives or what, at what age um, did you was like a turning point or an aha moment where you like realized you wanted to be an actor or like realized you were kind of different from everyone else and like you wanted to pursue that? Was there like a mentor? Like how did that develop? And then I'm curious about the future also. So um, being at Google and thinking about the future of media consumption and theater and entertainment, YouTube and in-person, online, digital era, like where do you see the future of your 
your careers, acting careers, entertainment, TV careers, movies, like what do, what do you think about that? Well, you know, I think about the second question all the time. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I do feel like, I feel like I'm in a very, very fortunate, but ultimately unsustainable place Agreed. as an actor who is able True. to make like money and be successful in the way I am. Like it's, I really feel like it's unsustainable because it seems like entertainment's become diversified in such a way that like being in like the big movie that comes out that weekend or whatever seems to be like, it's still holding on, but it seems to be like right. the past, in my opinion. But uh, at the same time, if you were to do an independent, like a small independent movie, that also could have more legs because of the digital age, correct? Yes, possibly, but it's big. There are so many, just by virtue of that being cheaper to make, there'll be a lot more of those competing with each That's other. That's a good point. You know, right now we're doing this play. You know, we're both, you know, very successful actors, you know, in <laughs> financial. And ways. very modest. What's that? <laughs> no, no. Uh, no, but I have to preface it by saying that. So I'm not, this is not a complaint, but we make like, uh, like $400 a week doing this play, which is the most exhausting thing that we do in, in our careers. Uh, so, um, so there's no correlation really between like effort and fi money, money. In, in like in our business it seems you know the thing that I make the most money from usually are like the easier things where you're on a set you know and you get a nice trailer and everything so um, That's really interesting. so yeah. so I don't see like the future of like my what I'm actually very interested in being like economically so sta sustainable uh, uh, and that might have more to do with what I'm interested in which is these kind of like smaller things than what uh, the industry is going to do. Do you have an opinion about it? Yeah, no, I agree. I, look, uh, th doing theater is exhausting, you know, and but you get nothing to do it. But it's fulfilling as an artist. But it's exhausting, and I, I mean, I just think everything's going digital. Everything is, and as much as you want to be like, hey, you know, I want to, I want to preserve these things. But why do we want to preserve anything? If it's going digital, that's great. It gives a lot of more people who have a lot more talent to be discovered as well. Yeah, that's you know? true, except I do think there'll be, you know, like everything, there's pendulum shifts. So I do think like the backlash to like everybody looking at their telephones to get their entertainment may be in theater's favor yeah. in a few years time. And we'll, we'll all be rushing to, uh, you know, where we want to see real people. Uh, there may be that backlash. I hope so. Yeah, I also hope theater's so. not going away anywhere. And one of the things that you guys have, and it is when you're being pragmatic and, and assessing yourself as successful, it's because you have the capacity to do one thing, then another, and one thing allows you to do other. That's true. And also that the more experience you uh, acquire, and frankly, the more influence, the more people you can bring along after you. Absolutely. And that's, that's an important part of being an artist. Yeah, that's true. Cool. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Well, gang, this has been wonderful. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, guys, for so much out. for coming. Thank you. <laughs>